everyone, and welcome back to our next summit um, session with Narelle McKenzie. Narelle is the director and a senior trainer of the Australian Radix Body. Well, oh, I'm sorry, my screen's going a bit funny. I'll start again. Narelle is a director and a senior trainer of the Australian Radix Body Centered Training Centre and the Radix Institute North America, which offers a three year training program in Radix Body Centered Psychotherapy. She's a registered psychologist with over 40 years experience working in private practice with adults, adolescents, families, couples and groups. With a master's in developmental psychology and extensive experience in training in psychotherapy and psychology, Narelle has led experiential training workshops on embodied psychotherapy throughout Australia, the USA and the UK. She's a clinical member and accredited supervisor of the Psychotherapy and Counselling Federation of Australia, an accredited psychology supervisor and a member of the United States Association of Body Psychotherapists, as well as a member of the Peer Review Committee, for the International Journal of Body Psychotherapy. Narelle, I feel tired just reading that out. Narelle's also been a valued speaker on our team for many years, and it's my great pleasure to welcome her now. Hi, Narelle, thank you for contributing to this event. Uh, you're muted, Narelle. Let me just switch your microphone on, please. Unmute. There I am. Thanks, <laughs> Thanks Carmen. <laughs> I'm just going to share my screen so everything's... Uh, here we go. Good. So I hope everybody can hear me. Um, <clears throat> It's good to be here today uh, to talk about restoring the natural rhythms of connection, uh, a somatic approach to healing the impact of trauma and attachment. In the first part of this session, I will discuss pulsation, which is the main concept of Radix work um, and uh, the different ways we work to restore the pulsation or as we think the natural connection that's in the body. Um, and finally, I'll end with some case studies, which hopefully will bring it all together in a meaningful way. As the title of this session suggests, when working with these topics from a radix perspective, we think of it in terms of restoring the natural rhythms of connection that get interrupted in some way or another when we are not experiencing a safe environment. Radix, the word radix, means root or source. And we think of the radix as the life force energy that underpins thinking, behavior, and emotions. So when we're working with a client, we may work with them physically and energetically. We may work with them verbally or focus on emotions or behavior in order to restore the pulsation or rhythm of connection. Usually we're working with a number of them. In some sessions, we may focus on self-connection and the loss of connection with self. On others, we may focus on connection with the other, the relationship, the or both. But the overall aim is to get a balanced capacity to both stay in touch with yourself and engage warmly with aliveness with the other. And we call this working with the pulsation or rhythm of connection. Every individual, of course, has their own unique pulsation pattern that enables them to function in the world that they have acquired through life experience. But clients usually come to us when they see this pattern as either past its use by date or has limitations in what they're wanting to achieve in the world, either in terms of relationships with other people or just achievements in their life. Today, I'm going to specifically be focusing on how we think and work physically and energetically, uh, but it's an assumption of our approach that, that we're also working cognitively and emotionally. And hopefully from the case examples I'm going to present at the end of this session, it will become clear how working in this way is also working cognitively, emotionally and behaviorally, even if the focus is physical. The radix, as we think of it, is very similar to what the Chinese refer to as qi. And the radix approach is a regulation model. However, unlike many approaches in psychotherapy currently, um, in order to achieve regulation um, in radix, we often encourage dysregulation if that is happening as a means to eventually 
uh, achieve regulation. So the work is not about calming down, um, keeping things at an even uh, keel. Sometimes it means people will express strong emotion, um, have strong opinion, um, and uh, that would be encouraged. Being able to shout would be encouraged as much as being able to whisper. Sometimes to restore uh, connection to oneself or connection with another, uh, one has to go through these processes of what's now commonly called dysregulation. Um, I think uh, this again might become more understandable when I present case studies. When we're talking about working with the radics or energy of the body, we're interested in how natural rhythms of the body become interrupted, unintegrated, or dysregulated. And the energetic flow of the life force in our bodies, like many other processes, is largely an unconscious one and one that we're not very aware of on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, for example, let's have a look at some of these other um, autonomic uh, processes. Hang on, I've just got to come down and click this. So uh, fight, flight is a, a um, and freeze collapse is a um, regulatory pulsation that happens. And we're, we all associate this very much with um, trauma. Uh, exerting yourself, say at the gym, and then resting is another example of a pulsation that we all take for granted. Sleeping, waking is another one. And we're all aware of how much uh, trauma in particular can interrupt that pulsation where people have, find it very difficult to sleep. Um, the peristalsis of the digestive system is another um, characteristic pulsation and one that most of the time we're not very aware of until it goes astray and then we get stomach cramps or something. The um, fluctuation between the sympathetic and the parasympathetic nervous system would again be an example of a pulsation. Our heartbeat, um, if we listen to it and the, and the um, Blood flowing from into the heart chambers and out of the heart chambers is another autonomic um, pulsation that can be affected. Um, and of course, obviously, our breath, the inhale and the exhale. And you'll see as I um, progress this afternoon in this um, session that in Radix work, we work a lot with the breath, uh, not teaching people specific techniques of breathing, but rather tracking where um, is there perhaps too much emphasis on some aspect of the breath and not the other, uh, some direction. I was also um, re reading through some old notes recently and um, I came across this slide that I'd made for another um, seminar on the characteristics that Dan Siegel thinks are, of um, constituting a coherent na narrative. Those of you who are aware of Siegel's work will recognize that he says it's not so much the attachment pattern that uh, occurred when you were young that influences um, your adult life. It's more uh, how, whether you have a coherent narrative about that pattern now in your adult life. And he lists these characteristics that he says are essential for a coherent narrative. And as I read these, I thought, oh, he's talking about, again, pulsations. So the first one he says is, describe how you would feel in your body, your sensations, your emotions, your perceptions, and your thoughts. So he's talking about that pulsation from the sort of primitive brain stem up into the cognitive processes of the brain and how uh, in a healthy functioning individual, that process is going on all the time, up and down, up and down. and um, you get a dysregulation of that process when it gets stuck in, in one way or the other. You know, either someone is always stuck in their thoughts, and this will come up in one of the examples I'm going to talk about later, and have very little um, connection with sensations and feelings in their body. We would say that there's an interruption to that natural connection uh, happening at that time. He also talks about there being um, an event, having a balance between your emotions and your thoughts, and he calls that horizontal integration. Uh, Alan Shaw would call that um, integration between the right and the left brain. 
And I'm sure we've all had clients who um, have a predominant uh, predisposition to go more left brain or more, more right brain. Ideally, you're wanting both of those to sort of, the pulsation between those to be more um, equal or homeostatic. And to be able to reflect on your life without ignoring effects of childhood or completely blaming your childhood for your present way of functioning. You can see how this is saying that you can get stuck on one end um, of, of a process rather than be able to flow. Um, to be able to discuss traumatic events that may have happened to you without it going either chaotic or rigid. Um, that again is a, an example of, you know, if you go chaotic or rigid, you're, there's a distortion of the natural connection, the natural flow, the natural pulsation that needs to happen. Relate warmly to others while having a strong sense of self. I don't know about many of you, but my experience is that a lot of uh, clients struggle with this in one form or another, that they can either be, really be there for the other, but then they lose a connection with themselves or they can stay connected with themselves and then they're a bit distant um, in their relationships. And finally, to accept life's uncertainties, not being either controlled or resigned by the fact that um, we're not really in control of a lot of our lives. So I just thought that was an interesting um, uh, way of thinking about what he's talking about, um, co our coherent narrative. Um, Sarah Ross says, uh, pendulation or is the natural pulsation between states of expansion and contraction in the nervous system. And that this is a basic principle of life seen in the ebb and flow of the ocean. And you would have seen that um, on the previous uh, slide that I showed that the, the ocean is a good example of a pulsation, a natural pulsation. Sometimes the sea can be really wild and then it comes back and slashes into the sand or the cliffs. Other times it can be quite calm, but regardless, there's that movement backwards and forwards um, without it being stuck. And she says, a resilient nervous system is one that can move back and forth between alertness and action, calm and rest, and you don't get it stuck on either extreme. And this idea of not being stuck on either extreme, or I think of it as more um, having all the possibilities available to you is one of the things that we like to work with in Radix. Um, and it's been shown um, that um, staying in one state too long negatively affects the body and can cause distress and disease. So usually, you know, if you think about it, you know, staying connected with yourself, staying in relationship with another, uh, being able to say yes, being able to say no, are all necessary processes that we need to have for survival. Um, not only in our autonomic nervous system, but in our behaviour, in our emotions. Um, being able to be, shout, to be able to shout is equally as important as being able to whisper. Being able to cry is as important as being able to sort of love. Um, so there are many variations of these natural connections. I thought um, Resme Menekin makes a point about calmness that's important. He says, being able to, in his book on my grandmother's hands, he says, being able to settle into your body is a crucial skill, but settling your body is not the best response in every situation. There will be times when you need to activate your body and act constructively. In fact, when settling is a reflexive response rather than a mindful one, it can be a form of avoiding or overriding the opportunity to heal. The keys to healing are staying with your body and discerning what you need to do next, then settling or mobilizing your body based on the situation. And I, I think this is really important and you'll see as I um, progress that um, we're uh, very much um, working with mobilizing some of the um, body parts and uh, body movements and breath and sound uh, with clients um, as a way of restoring these uh, natural uh, processes of connection. So I think um, 
In our practices of psychotherapy, I think it's common for us to work out, for example, if we're going to choose this topic of attachment, that someone with an avoidant attachment pattern needs to reach out and connect in a more vulnerable way. Or someone with an anxious attachment pattern needs to develop a stronger sense of self. What we fail to realize sometimes, I think, is that each of those behaviors or patterns of connection require a large number of sub skills. And it's very easy to pass over these um, and not take the time to explore um, how they're being interrupted or why they're difficult. And that if one has the experience of these uh, disrupted patterns of attachment or even trauma, these sub skills often haven't developed or if they have developed the capacity to use them is often being diminished. And so uh, a lot of the work then involves reconnecting clients to parts of the body where there's a stagnant or an absent or an irregular pulsation happening in their body um, that interferes with their capacity to either reconnect with themselves or reconnect with another. So how do we do this? Well, in Radix's work, um, we have its, Radix has its roots in Reichian theory. And Wilhelm Reich was a student of Freud who focused on what was happening in the body. Not only what clients were verbally expressing, but actually what was happening non-verbally. And from his work, he proposed that clients find ways to block or interrupt their life energy in their bodies, which impact their capacity to fully experience and express their aliveness and their capabilities. And firstly, he proposed that the life force in our bodies flows or pulsates in two major directions, either uh, from the core, from, from our deep inside, you know, um, body parts, if you like, to the peripheral muscles uh, and back again. So there's this flow from deep inside us out into the peripheral muscles um, of our arms and our legs and our hands and our arms um, and up into our heads, out through our eyes, our mouths. And also uh, the life force, so this life force energy flows vertically up and down our body. And so the life energy underpinning thoughts, emotions and behaviours can be interrupted in a very general way in either of those or both of those directions. And he also proposed that, um, if I come back here, uh, yeah, let's go, we'll skip that for the moment. He also proposed that um, there are seven segments in the body um, that function differentially from each other in the sense that each of these segments could express, for example, a different emotional expression or way of interaction that is completely independent of the others. So um, one way um, of doing this, and I'm going to look a bit stupid now, is um, so I can be frightened in this upper segment, this ocular segment, and if I was, you know, traditionally, if I'm frightened, my eyes might be, you know, wide open and surprised looking. And I can feel sad in this segment. And I can feel angry in this segment so that um, Often, this is why um, clients uh, complain of being confused. One way of thinking about confusion is that different segments in the body are expressing or in conflict with each other in terms of what the, the main expression is or what the main experiences that a client is having. So when an individual has a secure attachment, for example, there will be congruency throughout their body in an energetic way. Um, so let's say uh, a, an aspect of uh, attachment is often uh, the capacity to reach out uh, and connect to another individual. If you've come from more of a secure attachment, um, you will feel that longing in your body and you'll allow that longing to sort of travel, if you like, or flow into all parts of your body so that when you express that desire to sort of connect, um, there will be a full expression of it. Uh, all of you will be involved in it um, and you will accept that it's an okay experience for you to have. Um, so, 
and you'll have the capacity because of your secure, secure attachment in your limbs, your arms and, and your hands and your, uh, to reach out and you, you'll have confidence in your legs and your feet that you can stand on your feet and you're not going to topple over if you express this feeling. So all of your body will be engaged in the behaviour and all of your body will be able to then rest when it's achieved. Um, and that would be an example of a, a very full and um, satisfying uh, pulsation or natural rhythm of connection. When this natural energetic flow is interrupted or out of balance, it'll be more challenging for an individual to even acknowledge that they have that impulse, that they want to reach out. Um, and they might ha have internal conflict or external verbal conflict in expression about whether that's a good thing to do. Um, or they may just lack the capacity in their arms and legs to have a sort of enough energy to do it, depending on the circumstances that they've been confronted with. Um, so um, what we're interested in Radix's work is, is how all of this gets um, interrupted. And um, here I have a diagram. Uh, it's uh, quite uh, small to read. I, uh, hopefully you have the handout. But if you start, start down here at the bottom, I don't know if you can see my pointer, but it says tolerating small energetic impulses of the body. So if we take this example of um, wanting to reach out and connect with someone, you know, you suddenly think of someone and you think, oh, I really liked, you know, some, maybe there's someone in a, in a meeting or a room or something, you think, I'd really like to go over and say hello to this person. You can either go with that impulse or you can talk yourself out of it. Oh, they wouldn't be interested in me. Um, oh, I haven't got time. Um, let's say you go with it. Um, you allow that impulse to build in your body so that there's more energy behind it. And you might walk over and stand around a little shyly, but you're there. And um, you're trusting that, you know, your legs are going to carry you there and you're going to have enough energy in your body to be engaging in some way. Um, and hopefully that person might re-engage with you and then you can let in the satisfaction of it. So one of the ways that we think about behaviours and emotions and feelings is where does the client interrupt that process? Is it in um, allowing themselves to even notice uh, the emerging impulse? Is it trusting that their body is a container that, so they can allow more of that sort of uh, passion or energy to build about whatever it is they're wanting to do or say or express. Um, an example of that often is I'm sure you would have heard clients who say, uh, oh, I can't possibly cry because I'll sort of, it'll just go all over the place or, you know, um, I won't be able to contain it. Um, learning there that your body is a container is very important. Um, if you're able to do that, you allow, you allow more of that passion for whatever it is you're wanting to do to sort of fill all of you, all of your body energetically, not just your mind. And uh, you can give it expression if it feels safe. Or you might even uh, give it expression in relationship. And then having done that, whatever that impulse is, uh, whether it's an emotional impulse, a thought, an action, you're able to surrender and let in the satisfaction, um, which then enables a new impulse to arise. So this process, this process of where you interrupt it can happen with a segment, you know, going back to the um, body, it can happen in one particular segment, or it can happen um, throughout the segments of the body. But what we're interested in is um, how, how it gets blocked. Um, so let's go here.
Now, the RADIX practitioner is trained to observe and work with where all of these subtle processes of connection get interrupted. We don't act as experts. We don't tell clients what they should or shouldn't be experiencing, um, nor do we act on the client or do to the client, a bit like you know a massage person might massage a short, sore shoulder. It's a collaborative process. Um, the radix practitioner is trained to observe and then bring their, their awareness of their observations to the clients by reflection um, and curiosity so that the client can then make conscious or uncover their, the subtle ways that they may be blocking these pulsations of a movement or a feeling or a thought. So, and then make choices about what they want to do about that. I think the first step is le learning to listen to the history of the client as they share their story and to notice the nonverbals as they do this. And um, from this, you're, we are trained, I guess, to determine what might be a good focus to begin with, recognizing that this may change as the work progresses or more information becomes available verbally or nonverbally. So one of the things we consider, um, forgetting to come down here, um, that's the therapeutic tools, is um, the first thing we consider is, is the client sufficiently embodied? We all walk around with bodies, but that doesn't necessarily mean we're in our body. Um, I've worked with athletes, I've worked with dancers, I've worked with singers, and you'd be surprised how many of them don't really have much awareness of their body. And in fact, one of the case studies that I'm going to talk about later, um, Mary is a great example. Um, when she first came to see me, she talked about a lot of physical things that she did, cycling, running, swimming. Uh, she has a, a extreme trauma history and it became very apparent very early that she has little body awareness. And she says that herself, she uses her body as a machine. It, it functions, it gets her from A to B. Um, we also think in terms of, uh, you know, what does this, as this person sharing with me, sitting in this room with me, do I have a sense of, um, they've got a good enough sense of, self-awareness and contact with themselves um, are they aware of me in the room uh, do they relate to me i've had clients who come in and they have an amazing um, self-awareness but i may as well be out having a cup of coffee and come back after the hour for the amount that they um, use me or think about being in relationship with me and again that i'm going to present someone who was a bit like that when he first came to see me Another um, thing we try to assess is uh, how grounded is this person? Now, um, I'm sure many of you who are therapists out there will say, well, I think about all of these questions too. I think the difference is that in Radix, we're thinking of it in terms of the body, the physical body and the energy body, as well as the psychological aspects of these um, concepts. So for example, in grounding, um, in radix, we think of three parts of the body being essential for grounding. We think of the eyes, um, being able to see clearly the environment around you in the present moment, um, being able to keep out what uh, people out with your eyes um, and being able to let in loving connections. We think of the hands and the arms as being very involved in grounding, being able to, to reach out, being able to, uh, for connection, being able to push against or away when connection's not wanted, being able to touch and connect, to pull something or someone closer, to embrace or hold um, a boundary. And the legs and the feet uh, also, uh, the legs and the feet give you a real sense of support in the world. Um, and, and also enable you to run and kick and jump and dance. But they keep you grounded in the present. Um, so when I talk about grounding in from a radix perspective, they're the sorts of things that we're attempting to assess. 
And again, in one of the case studies I'm going to present a bit later, there was one guy who in particular who was very ungrounded, and I'll talk about some of the things that we did with him that really helped him. Uh, and you could see that when I was talking about the hands and the arms and uh, in particular, uh, we're thinking about that as being very, and the eyes, we're thinking of them as very much related to boundary work. Uh, some people have very, very soft eyes, very open eyes, very, they're lovely eyes, but they can't keep people out with their eyes. Other people stare, keep people out with their eyes, but they can't soften their eyes. Um, <clears throat> Similarly, some people have a lot of difficulty pushing or pu pulling. Um, you can see push and pull, there's a pulsation. You, you want to be able to do both aspects of those things. Some people have overdeveloped pushing roles and some people have overdeveloped pulling roles. And so you're wanting to get um, that natural connection flow between both of those. And, and containment, just being able to think of the body as a container and to learn how to use particularly the muscles in your body to enable you to contain what you don't want to express. So often when people are, are worried about, um, you know, never being able to stop crying or um, if I start to connect with my anger, I'm going to go ballistic and I'm going to lose control. Uh, often in a radix way of thinking about things, we teach them first how to contain those feelings so that they then feel safe to um, experience and express them. And of course, you know, central to all of this is the therapeutic relationship, what's going on moment to moment um, in the relationship between client and therapist. So um, what is it we actually do in a session? Um, first of all, there's um, observation and reflection I think that's probably one of the really central things you learn to do is to observe the body, to, to identify what the pulsations are in the body uh, of this energetic flow and, um, and then to reflect those back so that clients start to become aware of them as well. And uh, Along with that, of course, is identifying what we call counter pulsations. So, for example, yesterday I was running a session with someone. It was actually online. The client was in Darwin and we were doing some exploration work about reaching. And uh, she did this. <laughs> um, and it was really interesting. So I sort of I just commented on what she was doing with her eyes. And uh, she found it very difficult to sort of um, see me and at the same time explore this process of reaching. So we would say that was a counter pulsation. So we'd go back to sort of work with what might happen for her to be able to do both. Um, the eye work is really important. In Radix work, we very much see it as the place you start to identify if someone can be really present and doesn't mean they have to be, they can be looking away, they can spend sessions with their eyes closed, but ultimately we want them to be able to be present in the room before you start doing lots of other um, work with them. It's also the integration segment we think of, you know, when people are expressing something, it's really important that it comes through the eyes. Some, there's something about when it comes through the eyes and is witnessed, um, there's a release that doesn't happen otherwise. We work a lot with respiration, not to teach um, techniques of breathing, but rather um, tracking uh, just the inhale and the exhale, coming back to this, this patterns of connection. Uh, on the inhale, you connect with self. On the exhale, you come out into the world. That's just a natural rhythm of connection. You close your eyes, you go inside, you connect with self, you open your eyes, you come out, you connect with the world. Um, so we're often interested in which of those um, aspects of the pulsation of inhale and exhale does a client find easier to work with. And again, and this will come out in one of the case studies. We work with sound. We're interested in um, 
I think here of uh, windows of tolerance, you know, some clients can sort of play around with noise, you know, it sounds very intimidating for them, but they might be able to sort of do soft sounds, but let's get the pulsation happening where they can do loud sounds and come back to soft sounds, you know, uh, neither's right or wrong, but they give you more capacity to be in the world. Movement, we work a lot with movement. Um, but it's movement in um, uh, rhythm with the breath. And there's a big difference between um, doing a movement, and I know this from my own experience, and just doing it, and doing a movement in rhythm with the breath. And um, one of the exercises I'm going to demonstrate a bit later in one of the case studies is, um, well, actually, this one isn't, but we could do it this way. There's a real difference to saying to someone, push, and they go. And then saying to them, breathe in and bring your arms back, breathe out and push. Breathe in and bring your arms back, breathe out and push. It's very hard not to stay connected with yourself when you're having to connect it up with the rhythm of your breath. I can do this and be thinking of going shopping, you know. Um, we work with physical contact. I've got touch down here, but actually it's physical contact um, because it's not just with the hands. Uh, so we may sit back to back with people. In one of the case studies I'm going to talk about shortly, um, I had um, the fellow put his feet on my chest and we worked with that. Um, so. Uh, Sometimes it's self-touch, uh, sometimes it's the therapist working with the client with touch, and needless to say, it's always negotiated and it's not uh, required. And as I said earlier, the whole transference and counter-transference um, situation. Okay. All right. Um, so I imagine there's a few questions coming up and I will have time for questions in a moment. I just want to talk a little bit about a little more of the theory before we go into the case studies and keeping my eye on the clock. I've got these pictures because when a baby is born, um, the life force is largely in the core of the body, but this life force energy. And if the infant in those very early days um, gets a sense of support and holding and containment and a receptive environment, if you like, the, the life force energy flows up into the head. And, you know, babies look around, don't they, with their eyes. It's one of the first sort of movements they often have. And over time, you know, they get to lift their heads up and down, they get to roll their heads. So you can see that a lot of energy comes up here into the head. And if this is um, received well enough, uh, with good care, the energy starts then to move down into the body from the core, um, down, up into the head and then down into the rest of the body, into the back, into the tummy, like this little kid um, lying on his tummy with a wave, you know, so he's got more energy now coming into his hands or her hands, uh, they're on their tummy. Um, <clears throat> they're getting all that support for their body. And so the energy can come in there. Um, the other little fella sort of got to a stage where he can stand up, push down onto things with his arms. And so, and the energy starting to come down into their legs and feet. <clears throat> so there's this connection with self and then a flowing out into the world as, as this energy comes more out into their periphery. And there's a joy and a delight and a curiosity about this. Um, so this little girl, you know, she's under her arm, she's into her eyes, she's looking through a camera. Um, <clears throat> there's a joy and a delight and a curiosity that, that comes with this. Um, so, you know, children reach, grab, pull, push, cry, laugh, throw tantrums, hugs, uh, walk, run, dance. But in anxious avoidant and disorganized attachment patterns where trauma occurs, these very natural passion pulsations get interrupted. 
And so many of the things we consider to be a natural rhythm of connection, like being up to reach, being up to run away, are disrupted or sometimes never developed. Um, now, of course, this happens in every family. Um, there's many reasons why natural um, rhythms get disconnected. In one of the earlier slides, I haven't shown, you know, it sort of says what interrupts these pulsations. Well, everyday life does. You know, life never goes smoothly. But the, the critical question is, can you come back to a sort of a balanced place rather than end up on an extreme? And of course, families have their own patterns of um, emotions, behaviours, thinking that they support. Um, some of this is conscious, some of it's unconscious, some of it's discouraged openly, some of it's discouraged not so consciously or encouraged. Um, but it means that as adults, we don't have the full realm of possibilities available to us. And I guess that's when clients come to see us. Um, so this is so I hope I'm making sense by it now, but this could be a good time, Carmen, for you to come in with any questions you have. Hi, Narelle. Yes, we've got two questions. Um, mm -hmm. First question is, do these tools adapt for differently abled individuals, such as an unsighted or physically challenged person? Um, yeah, I haven't actually worked with someone uh, with vision, uh, severe vision problems, but it would work because you would work, you know, you would work with other parts of their body, their other senses. And I have worked with um, over the two people who were uh, in wheelchairs, uh, one through health issues, he was an older man, and uh, one young woman who was in a motorbike accident when she was about 19. And um, the main challenge there was to have a room where there was accessibility and then um, sometimes um, and a room that was big enough to have the, the wheelchair so that we could get, uh, either do work in the wheelchair or move them out of the wheelchair onto a sort of mat or cushions. But um, both of those people um, got some value from the work. Yeah. A um, couple more questions. One person has said, I imagine traumatic births, example, forceps, suction, suction caps, etc., would have an impact? Um, yeah, I imagine they do initially, but I, I always think it's it's sort of the, I think it's David Boadella uh, who developed a somatic approach called biosynthesis, and he says it's um, overall, it's the environment you meet. And I think even if you've had some traumatic births, um, it's how your caregivers respond to that and respond to you know, that it can be quite a healing process. You know, it's, uh, it's a bit like Dan Siegel's work when he talks about emotional work and stuff. And he says it's not so much that you've got to get it perfect, but that the repair is done. Uh huh. Thank you. Uh, another okay. person says, asks, could therapists work without physically touching clients by knowing safe touch with or from others are important to clients who have attachment difficulties? You mean allowing the client to touch themselves, sort of working with the touch of the client that way? Um, uh, let me look at it again. Could therapists work without physically touching clients? by knowing safe touch with or from others are important to clients who have attachment difficulties. Look, I, I think, I, think you, I am. Uh, <laughs> I, yeah. I, I think you could ask, you know, if they're in relationships or they have friends or something, you could talk with them about the possibility of playing around with that with their friends or their partners, <laughs> um, for sure, yeah. Uh, I wonder whether radix psychotherapy works with neurodivergent individuals. Yeah, I, I have worked with people who are neurodivergent and, um, you know, it's a matter of entering their world and finding out where they have difficulty and then working with that just as you do with anybody else, I think. Mm. Thank you. Um, other person asks, 
How do we get people to come into their body if they say they can't, i.e. I don't know how? Yeah, um, I think sometimes you just have to, uh, I had a man who, I, what, what, there's several answers to that. You just have to experiment. Um, so I'm just thinking of this uh, client I had uh, years ago um, who had no self-awareness of his body much at all. And so we agreed that for several sessions, I was just going to ask him to do three different movements with his body. And he was going to tell me whether he noticed anything about himself that shifted. And I did give him clues. So I told him things like uh, temperature, uh, change in his breath, a sense that somewhere in his body, something relaxed or tensed up. Um, I can't think what else. I think there were about six things I gave him. And one week we did things and he said, no, nothing shifted. Another week he started to notice some things shift. <laughs> um, and over time he started to, to pay attention to certain aspects of his body. So it was slow work, but he got there. Thank you. And a final question, is radix or are radix and body psychotherapy the same? Yeah, yeah. Uh, not all body psychotherapy is radix work, no, no. Uh, radix body psychotherapy is radix body psychotherapy, but there are many different kinds of body psychotherapy, yeah. And, and what would set radix apart from other body psychotherapies? Um, well, two things come to mind. Uh, one is that we do work with pulsate. We're thinking about working with pulsation all the time. Um, and we're not just on about uh, self-awareness, uh, body awareness. We're on about actually actively shifting some aspects of body awareness, which will come clear in the case studies if I get around. Um, and the other one is that, um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, or I think I did, uh, we're not afraid to let people dysregulate in body psychotherapy. So it's become a bit of the trend uh, in the last 10 years or so uh, with trauma work to very much have this emphasis on everything has to get sort of regulated and calmed down. Um, in Radix, we're trained to deal with people who um, are quite dysregulated and work with how to bring them back into a regulated state. So I think they're two things that would be quite different. Also, you know, we do actively work with the body. We don't just talk about the body. Um, so that's probably a good thing to move on to case studies, or I might not get there. So, <laughs> um, so uh, I want to talk about three people if I have time, at least two. Um, so Bob is probably a good example of someone with an anxious attachment pattern. Um, he had relationship uh, issues when he was young. Um, he, if we go back to the segments, he presented with a lot of energy in his head. He, and he described having to be in his head all the time as a kid in order to protect himself. Um, his parents had a somewhat volatile relationship and, and split up when he was six months old. Um, he, he stayed with his mother who moved in with relatives and he said um, she was quite anxious and obviously upset. So he felt she was loving, but sometimes inconsistent in her capacity to provide that. He didn't have any contact with his biological father until he was about two and a half. And then by then his father had a new family and uh, he would move between both families. When he was four, his mother repartnered and his stepfather had children who were much older than him and bullied him. So he said throughout his early childhood, he, he um, felt that he was always having to adjust to different families and different family systems. He didn't have much time to drop deeply into his own experience and feel safe. Um, he ran a lot uh, every day, but he wasn't in his legs and feet. And that was self-reported. Um, he worked in the creative arts, but he felt he had to always keep pushing himself to, to fulfill um, his dreams. 
When he was in a relationship, he reported that he completely lost a sense of himself. Um, <clears throat> he had a lot of fear of abandonment as an adult, which meant that he paid all the attention to his partners and, and sacrificed himself in the process. And in fact, it was in the second week of our sessions, I think, that his partner at that time left him and he went into a great crisis around that. Working with him somatically, I noticed that he had a little connection with his legs and feet and his neck was extremely tight. So um, I asked him to um, just go over into a sort of a, a position like this where he was dropping his head and he couldn't do it. His head had to stay like that. There was just so much tension um, in his neck. Uh, he tended to push the out breath and didn't spend very much time with his in breath, with the inhale. He was very engaging with me, um, quite charming, in fact, but had little sense of experiencing himself. So going back to the radix concepts, I decided that we had to focus on two areas, building his capacity for this contact with himself and eventually staying in connection with self in relation to the other. And that we also needed to do a lot of grounding work. And from what he told me, I decided that he needed to do early grounding work. And by early, I mean early developmental grounding work. Um, <clears throat> because he needed to learn that he was a grown, successful, handsome man, actually, um, who could survive abandonment. Um, so the grounding work we did was the one that I explained um, earlier. I had him, now I can't do, I can't lie on a mat here at the moment, but imagine I'm lying on a mat and, and I'm him, and I had him sit, and just put his feet like this up against a mattress on the wall and just breathe in and see if you could feel the contact of the mat. And then um, as he did that, I had him push on the inhale and relax on the exhale. And he would just lay pushing on the inhale and the exhale for a while. And then we switched to him doing the same exercise after negotiating this with his feet on my chest, starting off first, could he feel the contact of my chest? and then pressing. And we did that for quite a while. And then we moved on to him actually standing <clears throat> where he was um, hanging over like this. And I had him breathe in and then pause on the exhale, breathe in, pause on the exhale, breathe in. And we did that very slowly, and I'm not going to do it because it'd be too slow and use up all our time until he came up and had contact with me. Um, he did that at home as well as um, <clears throat> in sessions with me, and he found that he started to have much more sense of his own experience and his own feelings. Uh, he got in touch with some anger, he got in touch with some sadness. Um, <clears throat> And uh, later in the, in the work, he worked with me for about two years, I guess. And later in the work, we did some reaching with his arms. And for him, it wasn't a problem to reach. It was a problem to be able to grab and hold on and bring into self. And so it was during COVID times. So he set up a broomstick um, across some chairs and he would breathe in and then reach and grab of the broomstick and really let his hands really, really grab the broomstick and let himself feel that it was his. And then slowly, as he breathed in and out, he would bring that broomstick back to his chest and let himself have it. Um, <clears throat> over time, he became more able to warmly relate to others and not lose himself. He became much less controlling of situations, more flexible. Um, he entered a new relationship toward the end of our work. He was much more vulnerable. He was able to support his needs in the relationship. And it, interestingly, he reported that he wasn't pushing himself in his work anymore. It was coming naturally um, because he had allowed himself. In Radix, we think of the inhale as building up the energy. So if there isn't energy in the body, if you build up more on the inhale, you allow more of that charge of the energy. 
Um, and to this day, whenever he gets stuck, he says he goes back and practices those exercises. Um, Tom, we're going to skip over Mary for the moment, but Tom, he was probably more an example of avoidant attachment. He came from a family background where his emotional and social needs were not attended to, but his physical needs were. His father worked away from home and his mother was overwhelmed with keeping house and looking after several children. He learned fairly early that his mother felt burdened and he didn't want to burden her anymore with his demands. He talks of wanting to be held by her and comforted by her, but the few times he recalls seeing Seeking this, his mother either ignored his request or acted as if she hadn't noticed it. Um, <clears throat> or she became overwhelmed herself emotionally, and so he from a young age felt he had to look after her. With Tom, the issue was to challenge this sort of self-independence sort of that he had developed. Um, recently, he said to me in a session, I present so together, but underneath I have so many needs and I don't even know what they are sometimes. Um, when he first came to see me, he wanted strategies that he could go home and practice, and it never occurred to him that he could use me in a session to address any of his concerns. He realised this over time and came back and said he really wanted to start to focus on this. And so slowly we developed some self-awareness in his body, but that was hard work because as soon as he would start to experience something, he would come, he would say, well, what good is it going to do me to know this? <laughs> um, in a, a session recently, um, a, a whole lot of uh, shifts started to happen. So I just want to briefly say this if I can in time. He was reflecting on how much time he now realises he needs to connect, connect to his experience of himself, especially around his partner. He said he realised, however, that it took time to check in what he was experiencing and sit with it rather than try and change it. But if he did that, he could go deeper. And he said when he did that the other day, he felt the grief of himself as a little boy. So I had him sit with this grief and asked him what he thought the boy might need. And after a while, he said, I think he needs a hug. And then interestingly, he went in to justify why his mother wouldn't have been able to give that to him. I, I commented on this and we came back to the hug. And I said, would it be possible uh, for him to ask his partner for a hug sometimes? And immediately his breath went shallow and his eyes looked startled. And he said, I think I'm about to have an anxiety attack. Um, but he could he was aware of it now, at least. In the past, he wouldn't have even been aware of it. So we, we stopped and talked about some other things and he calmed down a little. And then he said he wanted to keep working on this. Um, and so um, we started to work with him just beginning to move his arms in the direction of how they would have to change if he was to have a hug, give someone a hug or, or uh, yeah, give someone a hug it was. Um, and so because one of the issues with him and his partner was around hugging. And so I had him again sit uh, with his hands and um, as he breathed in, uh, to rest them as he breathed out to just start to move them up as if you know I'm doing it again much faster than he did it and we didn't get up to there we only got a little bit of the way because he said I don't deserve this so I had him keep saying that as he was trying to hug that he didn't deserve this um, then his brows started to furrow and he said this is all incomprehensible so then I um, one thing I've learned is that when people start to get think things are incomprehensible or confusing, there's often a lot of tension in their forehead. So I suggested he just gently tuck his forehead and keep saying to me, this is incomprehensible. And as he did that, it took about three or four minutes, he started crying quite deeply. And then he looked at me and he said, it is okay, isn't it, if I'm not coping or when I can't do something or when I need to ask for help. It is okay, isn't it, if I ask for help. Um, <clears throat> so uh, we, of course, address that. It is okay for him to ask for help. We still hadn't got much to the reaching. But he did say that his partner had kept wanting him to hug her. But... Um, he could just couldn't do it. Um, and he said, and if he did do it, he wasn't embodied when he did it. Um, so there was a whole lot of tension. 
there was a lack of pulsation. There was the natural connection that should be in his arms to reach and hug and hold um, just wasn't there. And so that's what we were working with. But interestingly, one last point I wanted to make was he then had this sudden memory of his mother giving him a warm but very brief hug after he'd had a bath as a little boy. He said they'd all have a bath together and then they'd get out of the bath and she would wrap him up in this warm towel. And because there were a few kids, she didn't take much time, but she'd just give them a quick pat. And he started to remember how wonderful that felt. So interesting. <laughs> um, so I hope that gives you a bit of an idea of how the work works. Thank you, Narell. We do have some questions, but I'm afraid we've run out of time. Um, uh, for those of you who are interested in your virtual store, we've got a special offer on one of Narelle's trainings that will probably shed a lot of light and, of course, a lot more detail on the radix that she's talking about. Um, and also, you can look Narelle up online and have a look at her website and her uh, training organisation that offers a certificate in radix. Um, Narelle, thank you so much. And, uh, okay. and in particular, for those case studies, which are really enlightening really interesting and quite moving actually. Good, thanks Carmen. It's been thank great. Thank you to be and thank you everyone for your participation in this session.